Ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the, the first panel of the afternoon when staking Meet DeFi. And we have the chance to have three experts on the subject with first Nicola, um, CTO of Swissburg. Um, then Paul, that, uh, that is uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Morpho Lab, uh, developing the Morpho protocol. And Pierre, uh, who is leading revenue initiatives at um, Trust Wallet. Um, so thank you all uh, for coming. We, we're going to um, tackle uh, topics of staking, liquid staking, and DeFi, um, see what's the evolutions of, of these products, and um, and see also what are the risks, uh, the challenges, and, and how can institutions access these, uh, um, these yields um, in the future. So maybe just quick introduction about staking, just wanted to remind you in case you, you forgot, coming from um, the inflation of each protocol, on, on in the case of Ethereum, for example, and uh, with uh, fees uh, also of, of the network, uh, fees plus MEV. Um, maybe, Paul, can you also remind us what you think of uh, is DeFi is uh, compared to staking? And just as a reminder, staking is not DeFi, uh, protocol yields. DeFi is everything that is happening on the execution layer. Yes, so uh, crypto is about transferring money with our banks, while DeFi is about doing all sort of financial primitives with our banks. So it's basically replacing traditional finance with, with algorithms. And in the case of Morpho, it's replacing lending and borrowing with an algorithm. Thanks. Um, thanks for that definition. Uh, and maybe, Pierre, do you, you want to quickly uh, introduce what liquid staking is? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, if uh, staking is the way uh, today to secure uh, the network and to validate transaction, uh, liquid staking is uh, kind of a fix or a patch on uh, staking to uh, bring more value to the person who is going to stake. Basically, liquid staking will uh, correct uh, efficiency for the liquidity by uh, not locking your assets. So uh, liquid staking is a kind of uh, staking uh, 2.0 for the users. Thanks for that. Um, that's super clear. Um, Nicola, um, at Trisborg, you're using um, these three kinds of, uh, of products, right? Uh, staking, liquid staking, and DeFi. That's right. um, can you maybe explain us what are the risks uh, of uh, these three kinds of products? And what is the difference between what we call in crypto CeFi, right? Centralized finance um, compared to these open finance uh, kind of yields? Okay, cool. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack in here. Yeah. <laughs> take your time, take your time. We, you have time? Okay, take your time. All right. Um, so if, if we start uh, with the beginning, and there is like a staking. So, so the level of risk is more like a systemic risk against the chains, and this is like what is the risk that you have. So if there is like a 50% attack, 51% attack on the chain, then like, yeah, perhaps your, your stake can be dangerous and, and stuff like this. So then if we look at uh, DeFi, we are at another layer because then the counterparty risk includes uh, the smart contracts, but also a bad actor that could do financial attack. So for instance, we can all remember the attack on, on Mango that happened in, uh, in Norton, where like basically it was a huge manipulation with uh, an oracle and a token that like has a small market cap, so a, an attacker can manipulate this and then drain the value of the, the, the uh, DeFi protocol, but it's not like kind of uh, technical. So it can be either technical or financial attack. And then the other question was regarding um, liquid staking. So before talking about the risk, more like the interest and why do we have liquid staking, right? So the point is that you always kind of like looking for more. So in a sense that like when you're participating in a proof of stake, your uh, asset is at rest and if you want, you're staking it, but then your question is like, what can I do with it? So typically, if you tokenize this, then you can start to have some other utility. So for instance, if you go on a borrow and lending platform and you lend if, well, that's cool. You can have like a certain interest. But then if you go on a liquid staking token, you can have the staking yield plus 
the yield coming on the borrowing lending platform so you can have more. And so it's always this uh, concept that like, if you tokenize the yield, you can then use this as an asset, a yield bearing asset and do some other stuff. That's very cool. No, that's great. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the last question was finally like the, the C5. C5 versus uh, staking liquid staking in DeFi. Yeah, so I, I, how I see is that like uh, ultimately some are the same, right? So I would say A16Z, you, you know, was uh, making this uh, what analogy. Is it? A16Z, what right. is it? Again? <laughs> uh, so this uh, American VC funds that is not so well known. Um, they, 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 they said that there was like um, the, the DeFi mullet, you know, CeFi in the front, DeFi in the back. And I would say that's kind of like uh, what, what Swissborg is in the sense that like, at, at the end, it's a, it's a question of convenience. There is a lot of people that like are, okay, I want to own my keys and there's some other kind of like person that like, you know, for instance, we have tons of person that like are still like not managing passwords correctly. Uh, still like, you know, being scammed when people are asking, oh, I'm the technical support of that company. Just give me your password. They're going to help you. And then, you know, your email has been hacked or whatsoever. So now just imagine that like this private key is your entire wealth, then this is gone. So for certain person that are educated, well, custodian system are the best. And from s some others, you, they're going to need help. And in that sense, C5 systems are going to be like this intermediary that are going to be helpful for this. That makes sense. Um, Paul, um, what's your, um, I know you have a, a take on that. Like what's your, um, what do you think are the advantages of open finance and, and DeFi versus C5? Yes, so um, I would say there's many, but I think the one that is the most striking when you think about DeFi versus traditional finance is the fact that if, if you look at traditional finance today, like banks and, and credit unions, like you have a ton of them. Like you have approximately 50,000 different banks in the world. Like they all have their, you know, the DevOps team, like their, their buildings, like their algorithms to lend and, and, and borrow assets, for example. And DeFi is a common infrastructure. Like that is the same for everybody. So you have one development cost for everybody. Uh, and, and so Ethereum is the common infrastructure and then DeFi is the common application layer for finance. And instead of having 50,000 times a development team working on a, basically the same algorithm, which is closed source in every single entity, well here we're all working on the same primitive. So Morpho protocol, for example, is fully open source and anybody can contribute and get paid to contribute to that protocol. And the paradigm shift here is that it, you divide the cost by 50,000 K, like 50,000 basically. And so this is one of the you know, advantages uh, that, that is really striking, but obviously you have many others. I would say like, basically you have three main things, like the openness, the uh, optimality slash efficiency, and the resiliency. So in, 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 in terms of resiliency, uh, you have the idea that the infrastructure on top of which DeFi is sitting, which is a blockchain, is obviously very resilient and very neutral, which is uh, a good thing to have when you're, you're building a financial service. Uh, when it comes to efficiencies, there is the argument which I made, which is about development costs, costs which are very, very low. If you think about the Uniswap uh, protocol that last Sunday, uh, or maybe one week, ago uh, did 5% of the Nasdaq volume approximately with 10 billion I think in terms of volume uh, in one day. Uh, it was made literally by two people or three people in the very beginning, the Uniswap V1 algorithm. And this is impressive to, to see that the development cost of coding these 700 lines of code of Uniswap is minimal compared to building the Forex exchange worldwide. So this is where like the true economic value is. And then you have, of course, like the social value, which is in the openness, the neutrality of algorithms, where basically anyone can access those, those, those code, anyone can see where the money is, where it's flowing, and also like every single line of the algorithm, how customers are treated, if they are treated equally, not equally, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I could talk very long on, on this subject because there's many advantages, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think I'll stop there. How would that composability? Yeah, definitely, yeah. As like a no, 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 I mean, frankly, that was amazing. And I, I want to come back uh, later on 
um, DeFi versus CeFi on your specific application of, of lending. But before that, Pierre, um, Nicholas kind of started to explain what liquid staking is, right? Um, if you want to add your definition, please go ahead. And where does liquid staking sit uh, in the DeFi stack and, and why it is important for the rest of the DeFi ecosystem? Uh, I think at the very beginning and still today, uh, staking is uh, the first uh, product of the DeFi. I mean, it's the easiest one for uh, uh, traditional people to onboard them uh, in crypto because it's uh, the DeFi product, uh, the closest of uh, the token itself. Uh, staking interact with uh, the native token of the chain, so it's uh, easier to understand for uh, everyone. And liquid staking come to fix some uh, issue uh, normal people could have with staking. Uh, your funds won't be locked, uh, you can uh, exit your position uh, when you want. Uh, for example, on Ethereum, liquid staking allows everyone to stake even if you don't have 32 ETH uh, on a, a self-custody way. So it's, um, it's a huge improvement uh, of uh, making these uh, services, the staking, available for uh, um, much more people uh, inside uh, the ecosystem. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, um, staking is, is the um, primary um, uh, value of, of proof of stake blockchains, and uh, liquid staking uh, with a receipt token um, should be the first DeFi protocol, um, at, at least at the bottom of, of, of the, the DeFi stack, and, and should uh, bring you know kind of um, the inflation and, and the fees value from the protocol back to to the rest of, of different DeFi protocols, such as uh, lending or or options and, and, and so forth. Yeah, coming. It it should be the first step for everyone who would like to interact with DeFi. Uh, should be to stake. Uh, your native token to get a liquid one, and then to go on Morpho, for example, to use it as a collateral. Uh, uh, liquid tokens are the safest collateral on a daily basis because uh, it's the only token uh, who is going to see its value increasing over the time uh, without doing anything, uh, thanks to the yield. So this will reduce the liquidi uh, liquidation risk for uh, every holders uh, on the lending protocol. Yep, and yeah, just to mention a uh, disclaimer, it's not an investment yeah, advice. Yeah, sure, sure, <laughs> of course. You, sh you, should, you, should, you shouldn't forcibly like, uh, go on Lido and then more for, um, to, to uh, stake your assets. So coming back on lending, centralized lending versus um, decentralized lending, I want to you know, come back to an event that you know, happened this um, earlier um, uh, last year, at the end of last year, where FTX, uh, I mean, we all know that FTX collapsed, and the largest creditor of the FTX was Genesis. Um, and obviously the fact that uh, several billions were missing in Genesis' balance sheet uh, you know, kind of um, applied a domino effect on, on all the centralized uh, lending that was managed by Genesis in the rest of the markets. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Paul, can you explain what kind of happened there? What was the problem, and how DeFi, uh, decentralized lending, and maybe you know, I'm still doing a, a bit of um, a publicity there, but more for uh, solve the, the, that problem? Yeah. So, so I think there's two points to make. There's one risk that DeFi does not solve, and one that it does solve. So, uh, there are two problems here. You have the fact that they were all intricated with one another. And, and this is not something that DeFi solves, because in DeFi, we have protocols that are basically composed with one another. This was a great advantage of DeFi, which I, I did not mention mm -hmm. before. But, but you, you can basically compose Uniswap with whatever, like Morpho, etc., cetera, to, to do more complex financial services. And because of this, it can happen that, for example, uh, if you uh, have some collateral deposited on a protocol and this protocol gets hacked, you have this chain of events that also happen uh, in DeFi as well as in CeFi. That said, there's really good advantages in, in being in DeFi is that uh, in the case of FTX specifically, uh, no one had n any idea of what was going on. Like I personally uh, had a lot of trust into FTX uh, until the event, so I had no idea what was going on. I think it's the case for most of people. And the reason why that is, is that because there was no possibility for people to actually check what they were doing. Like 
at no point in time you were able to check the, the balance sheet, etc. So you have obviously advantages in that in terms of privacy, but maybe at some point you could expect some you know, trust anchors in their processes, which they, which, they, which they did not have. And I think that obviously if we had those, uh, it would at least have constrained the way they behaved because for example, in the US, they, they had, so you had FTX in the Bahamas, but also FTX in the US. In the US, they were constrained, and you had those trust anchors, not through DeFi, but through regulations. And people were able to check that they were not doing like nonsense. And in, in DeFi, you don't have really the need to even have this kind of regulation because it's all trustless. And it's, it's a continuous verification of what's going on. On the Morpho protocol, for example, you know at every second where every single sense is deposited where it is, you can track everything, you know exactly what's going on. So I think that's a, a very preventive way to have fund managers, for example, to do complete nonsense uh, uh, with their finances. So I think that's one of the, the, the great advantages of DeFi. Yeah, um, I completely agree. Um, and Nicholas, can you um, also maybe expand um, to what's the vision of Swissborg? Uh, versus a uh, centralized app um, and off again like offering all these uh, uh, staking, liquid staking, DeFi yields to, to your uh, customers? Yeah, so regarding Swissport, the point is really to be able to make it easy to access those products um, because uh, w one thing that like we haven't touched on is that like DeFi is in a very early age and um, it is not easy to, for anyone to kind of like figure out who are the trustless protocol that like, you know, founders are there to do like good jobs. There has also been a track record of uh, founders trying to kind of like take advantages of those protocols. So Swissborg is here in a sense that like uh, we do a curation of the protocol and then uh, we do a management of the positions because um, on most of the protocols, just passively providing liquidity sometimes is not enough. You might want to have more to be able to protect your assets and that's what Swissborg is about, is to really help anybody to kind of like access the DeFi product. Um, yeah. And, and that's a question I also have for uh, Paul. We, we've been, um, talking about DeFi and, and sometimes retail customers that, that, that you have on Swissborg, but how do you see also institutions coming into the space? Uh, what are kind of the challenges for these institutions to be exposed to staking, liquid, liquid staking and DeFi yields? Um, maybe starting with you, Nicola, and, and then Paul, I would love to, love to have your, your view on that. Uh, um, so I would say, um, for us, the, the, the biggest question is that like, as we are pooling assets from our users, it's kind of like increasing the what's at stake. So it's really about like security, safety, and being able to protect this efficiently. Um, so that's the number one concern of Swissborg and, 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 the, and the value that we provide to our users. Got it. Got it. Um, Paul? Yeah, uh, so on, uh, my opinion is that to be honest, currently I think DeFi is made for DeFi people. Uh, and this is why you have like tools like Swissborg that enable people that are not in the DeFi world to interact with DeFi, but also it has been strictly, structurally imagined for people with very, very low regulatory constraints, for example. It's just like if, if you go to, to lending protocols, it's fully permissionless. So like there's no uh, constraint or barriers to entry, which is obviously a big problem for many, many big financial institutions. So if you take JP Morgan, for example, they're not willing to you know, share uh, money with uh, a country that is not necessarily in, uh, it, that is in a sanctioned list or what, whatsoever. So I think that as DeFi will mature and need to tackle broader markets, it will have to evolve, evolve in such a way that it enables a separation between users depending on the conditions that each and every of those users have considering their regulatory constraint, their risk constraint, etc., etc. So if we take an example, like, you know, obviously you have the KYC, which is very famous uh, in the, uh, in the uh, traditional finance system. 
so for example, Aave, another lending protocol, decided to bootstrap a protocol which was KYC gated. Right? Only people that performed a certain KYC could enter the pool. But the problem then is that everybody has a different KYC, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that in general, DeFi infrastructure has to evolve to adapt to the constraints of the real market. When I say real market, I'm not saying that DeFi is not a true market. I'm just saying that it's very, very small compared to the traditional finance usage. And it's also very not sufficiently connected to the real world usage. It's like today, uh, like I, I work, I've been working in DeFi for three years now, and it's most of the usage is still very speculative. And every, every month, every year, we, we're getting away from this for real-world use cases. Uh, but I think like new infrastructures that enable uh, more selectivity on the users will, will be primordial. That's one thing. And also, you need a good risk-reward ratio. And in DeFi, the risk-reward ratio is not so obvious because like, there's a ton of risk regarding smart contract, regarding like, market, etc. Except for one use case, which is staking. And staking is in my opinion, the incentive for people to, to jump into DeFi is like literally very, very, very low risk compared to a very important reward, in, in my personal opinion, not financial advice. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think this is definitely an entry point for institutionals in the sense that the yield is sufficient. Like institutionals are bearing a representation risk, they're bearing a, a compliance risk if they jump into DeFi. So the, the reward has to be sufficiently high such that they're willing to make that risk and to take that risk. And this is why I think staking is going to play a major role in this institutional adoption. Yeah, I mean, I can only agree. <laughs> uh, but maybe just a very quick question. So you touched about KYC, you touched about um, staking, you also touched about this, um, I think, challenge um, that we need to see more CFI, DeFi connection, uh, maybe CFI products with the same uh, DeFi um, experience, uh, openness, transparency, and easiness of, of use. C can you expand a little bit on that? And yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so Obviously, I'm not saying we, we, we should put uh, KYC on all, all DeFi. What, what I'm trying to say here is that if you look at the email, the way emails works is that you have the SMTP protocol. So it's a few, a, a small algorithm that is going to state how you know, the, the content of an email is going to be forwarded from one person to another. It's completely neutral, permissionless. Anyone can use it, whether you're like you have uh, terrorist activity or, or whatever activity, you can use SMTP. And then you have the interface, the client, which is potentially like Gmail or Hotmail. And obviously, Gmail and Hotmail are you know, what you could claim as being the equivalent of CFI in, in, in DeFi. So you have some sort of parallel where you have SMTP, which your equivalent would be Uniswap or Morpho in DeFi. And then you have like Gmail or Hotmail, which uses SMTP. And then you would have CFI, like Swissbox, for example, that is going to provide access to SMTP, uh, sorry, to Morpho or Uniswap, uh, but through like, you know, enforcing regulations, for example, or enforcing a certain level of, of, of trust that uh, uh, is required by uh, an institutional, for example. And I really like to see it this way because you don't want to impose constraints at the lower level. Like, for example, imagine the nightmare it would have been if HTTP had to be constructed with KYC constraints like from the start. Like, this doesn't make any sense. So, so yeah, this is basically my, I don't know if this is specifically your question. No, but, no, no, uh, that's, oh. that's, that was very interesting. And um, did you see that that way or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that kind of like uh, goes in the same direction I was saying before is that like how we see it is that at the moment going in, in DeFi is still like rough. And, and we see the role of Swissborg of making it more accessible and easier. Right. So that like, I don't know, when you uh, go to see a bank and you want to do an investment, you don't need like 20 hours of studying all the details and knowing everything about your money. You know, you kind of like, okay, that fits my needs in terms of risk profile and uh, what I'm going to earn of that. And then you sign up and go. And Swissborg wants to be the trusted partner to be able to do that the same way. So we're all about like facilitating so that like anybody can embark in a crypto journey and, and benefit from it easily. 
do you uh, think it's the role of trust wallet as well to, to be this um, trust um, um, gateway, um, decentralized uh, way of, of being uh, a bank and offering these this yields uh, to, uh, um, to the world, to, to trust wallet customers? Yeah, I mean, at Trust Wallet, we try to be uh, the front door of Web3 and DeFi for uh, uh, traditional people. Uh, we want to uh, have our users responsible for the action. We do not have the uh, private key or price phrase at the opposite of uh, central ad services. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, we are not going to have a KYC on the operation as we are not responsible for uh, our users' activity. Uh, but we try to always educate them and to bring them uh, the more uh, relevant information to let them uh, take the best decision. For example, inside the app, uh, before uh, a user is performing any action, we can show him a security scanner uh, depending on the smart contract or the address he's going to interact with, just to uh, prevent him, A, hey, you are going to interact with something uh, who could be fraudulent. Are you sure you want to perform this action? But we are not going to uh, throw these assets or to uh, forbid him uh, to, to perform any action. Uh, everyone uh, at Trust Wallet are uh, the owner of uh, the assets, and uh, this is the main difference with uh, centralized services, uh, as uh, Morpho said. Amazing. Um, so before we open it to the audience, um, a lot of friends there, I can see. Um, <laughs> Um, if, if you have a crystal ball, right, and you can tell, uh, or how do you imagine staking, liquid staking and DeFi in five years, starting with you, Pierre? I think DeFi in general are uh, full of promises for uh, everyone. And uh, the main reason is, uh, in my opinion, because at the very beginning of DeFi, uh, we didn't have any rules except uh, code is low. But uh, above this, uh, we, we uh, didn't have uh, any uh, regulation. So we tried to build an ecosystem uh, as fair as uh, we, we could. And this is a massive change uh, compared to the traditional finance. But now we are at some point, uh, we need to still increase the user experience to onboard, to onboard more and more people uh, inside DeFi uh, without using uh, traditional finance or centralized services. But in the same time, if we want to have a uh, huge inflow of cash from institutional investors or uh, institutional companies who are heavily regulated. We have to find a way of uh, how we can fit the requirement from the regulators to let these uh, institutional investors to come uh, inside DeFi. So uh, if I could have a crystal ball, I would say, uh, I think uh, the main point would be how we are going to increase the user experience uh, to be uh, as frictionless as we can to onboard everyone in DeFi, and at the same time to be sure uh, we are going to be compliant with uh, as many as regulation we can uh, on the long term. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Paul, what's your vision on in yeah, five years? I, I, I believe that with time, like we'll be able to build abstraction layers, like. It, at many levels. So what I mean by that is it, it's, it's also coming to user experience in some points. Is like you have ETH, and in my personal opinion, soon you'll have only liquid stakes. Like almost you won't have really much ETH. And you will not be paying gas with your ETH. You're probably paying gas with liquid stakes. So all of this you know, experience uh, will be completely abstracted for the user. It will be natively better without you knowing what's happening in the in the back end. When you'll be using your, your, maybe not five years, but maybe a little bit more, but when you'll be using like whatever bank account, behind this, you will have like blockchain technology. And maybe it's going to be a private key that is enclaved in your phone and you don't even know about it. So what I believe uh, is really going to, to, to push this space forward is probably abstraction of all those different layers, whether they are very technical, but like whether they are pure, pure user experience. And I don't think like the blockchain technology in general is something like AI where you can witness and see, oh, wow, this is amazing, this is completely new. I, I, I think it should not change anything in our life except that the services that we use are more resilient, they're more open, and they're more efficient. And except for this, like, it should not be changing much our life. That's how I see it. Very exciting. So uh, blockchains, when using your bank account in, in not five years, but five years and a half, right, you said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, approximately, yeah. OK. Nicholas. So now, like, you know, 
when we look how many of you are exposed to the bonds of our, your government, very little, usually it's repackaged product and at the end when we look at the natural yield of any currency being the US dollar or the euro, very few of us have access to it and, and this is really what like crypto is about, is about now removing all the buyers for, because in traditional finance, you know, there is the so-called accreditor investors. So basically, not everyone <laughs> deserves to have uh, access to certain products. And, and now we can finally break those barriers and, and offer the natural yield of the platforms to everybody. And I believe this is really what is everything about here. Thank you. Cool. Um, that was amazing. But um, do you have any questions for uh, these gentlemen in the audience? Questions? Raise your hand. William. I have a question. Was it Paul, right? Uh, do you think. Is this on? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Do, do you think zero knowledge tech is going to. Um, open up DeFi to institutions by, uh, you know, allowing things like uh, KYC, non-invasive KYC? Uh, yeah, definitely. So what, what are the requirements of, 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 of institutionals? I, I did not discuss it with privacy because obviously blockchain is great because everything is transparent, but blockchain is bad because everything is transparent and you don't want like everybody to know what your finances are, what is the state, etc., etc. However, you may want it to be verifiable and selectively verifiable. And this is what zero knowledge tech is quite useful about, is that it helps people being able to prove a certain state of their finances to a certain set of people, which I think is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, and by the way, without revealing the finance itself. Uh, and, and I believe zero knowledge tech is, is somehow very complementary to blockchain tech in so many different ways. Uh, and, and privacy is one of them, and uh, it should be able to fill the different constraints that they have in terms of privacy. Some of them, it's not just about their privacy, it's just the constraint that they have. Uh, that said, I think there's still a lot of work to do uh, in, in that front. I, I'm starting to see a bunch of solutions, you know, just starting, but uh, it's, it's not ready yet, uh, in, in my opinion, to be fully, you know, uh, used in the wild. At least I did not see, like, major, you know, uh, use case leveraging this tech. I'm sure it will happen, and may maybe I'm wrong, and there is one big one, but, uh, but yeah. So, yeah, so for me, yes, it's a clear yes. Uh. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, I had a question about liquidity being fractured across different chains. Um, do you have, maybe both on the Swiss Borg side and Trust Wallet side, a view on how to improve the user experience there, either via um, uh, bridge, uh, interfacing with different bridges, or, um, or maybe just your view on how the ecosystem will, will evolve? Are we going to have more chains that keep capturing, uh, fractioning liquidity, or do you see a consolidation there? So um, I would say. How I see it is kind of like uh, the same way that like tech has been working in the past in the sense that like at the moment uh, every possibility is being tried out uh, in crypto so that like we, we see and organically speaking some will be more successful at attracting than others. So I don't think that like we are going to have like the one system rule them all. I don't think that this is going to be the case. But I think a handful of ecosystems are going to trump others and, and become more like predominant. So I, I think the, the liquidity will tend to, to, to converge towards those and, and some after just niche products uh, for particular use case. It will uh, always follow the opportunity. I mean, if you have a new chain with a higher yield, uh, because protocol will, uh, will overpay with uh, the own mining program, uh, liquidity will follow uh, this path. Uh, but at some point, uh, like with uh, TorSwap or with Axela, uh, I think we are going to have some uh, DeFi tools to move uh, the liquidity from one chain to another uh, on a very simple way uh, without using complex bridge or anything. 
uh, like for example one inch or power swap did for uh, EVM chain by moving the funds. Uh, I think we should have the same for uh, real cross-chain activity with some uh, protocol who are going to just uh, allow uh, the mass market users to move that liquidity from one chain to another one. Uh, yeah, very simply. Okay. Oh, I think um, he, maybe one question. No, um, it's it's up to Marie. So like. Uh, okay. Uh, if one quickie. What, if you have one question, uh, be quick. Uh, anyone? Okay. Then thank you very much.